Hi, it's Katrina. The Octavius Ghost Ship According to legend, the Octavius was a ghost ship that was found off Greenland's west coast in 1775. The story claims that a five-man crew of another vessel called the Herald saw the derelict ship and went aboard to assess the situation. Below deck, they discovered Octavius's 28-man crew dead, frozen, and perfectly preserved. The captain supposedly died sitting at a table in his cabin, with a pen in hand and his logbook in front of him. The bodies of a woman, a boy beneath a blanket, and a sailor with a tinderbox lay nearby. Unwilling to search the vessel, the boarding party grabbed the logbook and disembarked. The logbook's last entry was dated November 11, 1762, nearly 13 years earlier. According to the logbook, Octavius had reached the Orient in 1762, after leaving England the previous year. For the return voyage, the captain ordered the crew to sail through the Northwest Passage, a treacherous and frigid sea route through the Arctic Ocean that serves as a connection between the Pacific and the Atlantic. This would perhaps explain why the ship's crew met such a tragic end, but Octavius was never seen again after the Herald crew supposedly found it and its logbook disappeared long ago. Consequently, many modern historians have written the entire story off as a myth. The Tunguska Event The largest impact event in the world's recorded history happened on the morning of June 30, 1908, when a region of eastern Siberia was rocked by a 12-megaton explosion. Known as the Tunguska Event, the blast flattened an estimated 80 million trees over an 830-square-mile section of forest. Only three people died, according to witness reports, owing to the area's remote location. The Earth was lucky this time. Mineralogist Leonid Kulik led the first attempted expedition to the site in 1921, but harsh weather forced the team to turn back. They reached it on their second try in 1927 and discovered the destroyed trees laying on their sides in an outward radial pattern spreading from the epicenter. Locals were initially reluctant to discuss the event with Kulik's team. When they were finally willing to talk, they described seeing a bluish, extremely bright fireball soaring across the sky, followed by a flash and then a loud explosion. The shockwave reportedly knocked residents off their feet, shattered their windows, and killed reindeer. Scientists think that the explosion was caused by a meteoroid exploding in mid-flight as it hit the Earth's atmosphere. Based on the damage, it would have measured between 160 and 200 feet long and was likely traveling at a speed of around 16.8 miles per second. It's believed that the rock heated up to 45,500 degrees Fahrenheit and blew up between 3 and 6 miles in the sky. It never actually hit the Earth. The blast released the equivalent of 185 Hiroshima bombs. But no impact crater was ever found, and there is no definitive proof that a meteoroid caused the massive blast. So no one can say for sure that this is even what happened. What researchers do know is that if an explosion this big happened in a populated area, it could easily wipe out an entire major city and its outskirts. Experts estimate that an asteroid the size of the one they believe was involved in the Tunguska event falls to the Earth once every 300 to 1,000 years. There have been much larger impacts, but they happen during prehistoric times, before humans kept records of these things, and before we even existed in the first place. The Dancing Plague Out of nowhere one day in 1518, residents of Strasbourg in modern-day France began dancing uncontrollably. They continued dancing for days on end, and more and more people joined in the chaos. Historical records describe how a woman named Mrs. Trophia started dancing wildly in the street. It had a contagious effect on locals, particularly young women. At the height of the so-called dancing plague, around 400 people were busting a move. But they weren't having a fun time. They were in severe discomfort, and their strange, constant movements were exhausting. Many people landed themselves at the hospital, and rumor has it that as many as 15 dancers died daily when the bizarre sickness was at its worst. Doctors determined that the dancers were not possessed, even if they were acting like it, but that they were suffering from overheated blood. 
Lacking solutions besides putting people in the hospital, local officials built a wooden stage for the afflicted to use to get the dancing out of their system. Thankfully, the behavior seemed to subside on its own after about three months. To this day, experts are unsure of what caused the dancing plague. They think that it could have been mushroom poisoning or some other physical condition, or that it may have been a widespread psychiatric illness known as mass hysteria. This is a phenomenon that occurs when a large number of people subscribe to an idea without thinking critically about it. It's often driven by widespread fear and paranoia. The mass hysteria theory makes sense. At the time, the region suffered from widespread disease and starvation, and its residents were known for being superstitious. It's not surprising then that this is just one of at least seven documented cases of dancing plagues happening there throughout the Middle Ages. And now for a very mysterious boy. But I first want to give a big shout out to Carol Freeman and Edwan Mong. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and join the Origins Explained family. Kasper Hauser A teenage boy appeared on the streets of Nuremberg, Germany one day in 1828 with an anonymous letter in his hand. It stated that the boy had come into the person's custody as an infant and that the guardian had never allowed him to leave the house, not even once. Another letter in the youth's possession identified him as Caspar Hauser and claimed that the boy's father was a cavalryman who had died. While he appeared to be physically healthy, the boy seemed mentally impaired. Because Hauser provided no backstory about himself, police imprisoned him as a vagabond. Many people assumed that he was a feral child who had spent much of his life in the woods. He eventually opened up about his past, claiming that he spent his entire childhood confined to a dungeon alone. Hauser described his living quarters as a tiny cell with a straw bed. He said that he was given just two simple toys to play with and received only rye bread and water for nourishment. The boy supposedly came face to face with another human for the first time shortly before his release when a man visited his cell and taught him how to write his name. The visitor concealed his face the entire time. Locals supported Hauser financially and he was taken under the wing of a schoolmaster. By all appearances, the boy thrived later in life, although he was the target of several attempted murders. He was stabbed to death in 1833, five years after being discovered. Nobody ever figured out who Hauser really was or where he came from. To make matters worse, inconsistencies in his stories proved that he was a liar, making it even more difficult to distinguish fact from fiction. Where do you think Caspar Hauser really came from? Why did so many people try to kill him? Let me know your theories in the comments below. The Great Vowel Shift During the Middle Ages, British speakers dramatically changed the pronunciation of the English language. Known as the Great Vowel Shift, this period of transformation began around the year 1400 in southern England and continued until 1700. Throughout the process, the sound of all Middle English long vowels and some consonants became so different it had long-lasting implication for things like spelling, learning how to read, and understanding English texts from before or during the period. Experts can't seem to agree on what caused the great vowel shift. In their attempts to figure it out, they look toward the 15th and 16th centuries, when the biggest changes happened. In the aftermath of the Black Death, people migrated rapidly from northern England to the southeastern part of the country. Some scholars believe that this may have caused a mixture of accents that brought on broader changes in the way of speaking. Other researchers theorize that the shift resulted from French words being incorporated into the English language. On a similar note, the middle classes developed a tendency to apply French pronunciation to English words. This stemmed from the English aristocracy's decision to switch from French to English. Consequently, the Great Vowel Shift could have been caused by people overcorrecting their speech in a misguided attempt to sound more French. On the other hand, this hypercorrection may have resulted from anti-French sentiments, prompting people to try to sound less French. But the plain and simple truth is that nobody really knows what led people to speak so differently that the English language sounds nothing like it used to. Who were the Sea Peoples? Civilization began spreading rapidly throughout the eastern Mediterranean over 3,000 years ago. The area was home to numerous advanced ancient cultures, 
including the Egyptians, the Hittites, the Greeks, and the Minoans. During the Late Bronze Age collapse between 1200 and 900 BC, a mysterious group known only as the Sea Peoples supposedly terrorized the region, wreaking havoc on the Egyptians and other societies. But their identity remains a mystery to this day. This ruthless seafaring group did not leave behind any monuments or written records. Knowledge of their existence is based solely on inscriptions left behind by the cultures they ravaged. One 13th century carving describes a tribe of naval warriors that no local population stood a chance of defeating. Based on the lack of mentionings of the Sea People's origins, it seems as though the Egyptians knew where they came from. In other words, this information was probably common knowledge, so ancient writers saw no need to write it down. Either way, none of the ancient texts about the Sea Peoples talk about their roots, leaving modern-day scholars to try answering this question on their own. The Egyptians described the group as northerners, suggesting that they may have come from Turkey, Sicily, or elsewhere in Europe. Some researchers have even theorized that the Sea Peoples were the Philistines, who were famously mentioned in the Bible for going to war with the ancient Israelites. In addition to not knowing where the civilization came from, experts have no idea what triggered them to abandon their homeland and adopt a lifestyle of raiding societies throughout the Mediterranean. Benjamin Kyle One day in August 2004, a Burger King employee found an unconscious middle-aged man by the restaurant's dumpster in Richmond Hill, Georgia. He was naked, sunburned, covered in red ant bites, and had indentations in his head from blunt force trauma. The man was rushed to the hospital where he became known as the Burger King Doe because he didn't have any ID on him. He didn't know his name, claimed to have no idea how he ended up in Georgia, and was unable to think of a single person he knew. The confused patient, who called himself Benjamin Kyle, ended up in a care facility for the poor and homeless. Nurses routinely tried to help him get his memory back, but nothing he came up with led to his identity. Years went by, and fingerprints, DNA tests, and facial recognition technology failed to determine who he was. No one recognized his picture on TV. The mystery was finally solved in 2015 by a team of genetic genealogists. Using a process of elimination similar to how they help adopted people find their birth families, they compared Benjamin Kyle's DNA to information from records databases across the country. His real name is William Burgess Powell. He is from Indiana and had cut ties with his family back in 1976 before abandoning his car, home, and other belongings and disappearing. Police found him living in Colorado, but soon enough Powell had fallen off the radar again. His name disappeared from job records and other official documents after 1983. Naturally, Powell's family was stunned to hear that he was alive, but they welcomed him back to Indiana with open arms, and he's rebuilt his life in the hometown he doesn't really remember. While it's great that Powell has finally learned who he is, no one knows what went on during the decades-long gap between his disappearance and when he was found outside Burger King. He doesn't remember, and there's no real way of knowing if those memories will ever return. The Wow Signal On August 15, 1977, the Big Ear Radio Telescope at Ohio State University detected a mysterious signal coming from the direction of the Sagittarius constellation. Known as the Wow Signal, the 72-second radio burst was 30 times more powerful than the region's typical background radiation. Simply put, it seemed alien in nature and some saw it as evidence that life exists outside our planet. It got its nickname after astronomer Jerry Eamon scribbled the word WOW on a printout of the signal. Although researchers were able to determine the relative area that it originated from, they failed to pinpoint its exact location or what caused it. They ruled out several causes, including glitches and no natural sources such as highly magnetic rotating stars called pulsars. The signal's frequency was measured at 1420 megahertz, which is the same frequency that hydrogen emits. This discovery further bolstered the theory that the WOW signal came from an artificial source. In other words, aliens. But not all experts agree that the signal's origins are extraterrestrial. Some think that there might be a rational explanation for it, and that there are probably natural causes behind it such as hydrogen clouds or a star. In 2017, a team of scientists discovered new evidence about what may have caused the WOW signal. 
they found that at the time the signal was intercepted, two comets were passing through the same region in the sky. This could not only explain the signal itself, but also why the signal never repeated. The comets moved on in their orbits, so it would naturally be a one-time occurrence. But as plausible as this theory may seem, it remains unproven for now. Tree Trunk Coffin In July of 2019, renovations at a golf course in Tetney, England revealed something shocking. While construction workers were revamping a stinky old pond at the golf course, they uncovered a wooden coffin from 4,000 years ago. According to a statement from the University of Sheffield, this was a sarcophagus that contained human remains, an old war axe, and bedding of plants meant to be a comfortable bed for the deceased. The coffin was created from a hollowed oak tree trunk and then buried underneath a mound of gravel. This type of burial was usually reserved for the most important members of society during the Bronze Age. Just like the amazing foundations that were uncovered in London, this ancient artifact had been hiding in plain view for decades. People had literally been shooting golf balls into the pond where the coffin was buried. Nobody knows who exactly was buried inside the coffin. The human remains were extremely decayed, and there isn't really written history from 4,000 years ago. All we know is that the grave probably belonged to a local chieftain. When archaeologists finish restoring it, the coffin will be going on display at the Collection Museum in Lincoln. Aristotle's Tomb During recent digs in Macedonia, archaeologists came across a mysterious tomb that some believe might actually be the final resting place of the legendary philosopher Aristotle. If true, this could be one of the most significant accidental discoveries in years. Excavations were ongoing at the site of Stagira, in what is today central Macedonia. This region was a part of ancient Greece thousands of years ago, about 2,400 years before today, when the great philosopher died. The archaeologist behind this discovery is Kostas Sismanidis, who's actually been obsessed with the archaeological site since 1996. However, it wasn't until 2016 that he uncovered evidence of Aristotle's tomb. What makes this theoretical discovery even more likely to be true is that Aristotle was born in this exact place in the year 384 BC. Even though he died in the city of Chassis in 322 BC, his ashes were likely brought to Stagira, where he'd been born and then put inside of a tomb. But over the years, the tomb was forgotten, and it eventually turned into more of a ruin. The tomb just discovered by archaeologists was definitely extravagant enough at one point to have been worthy of Aristotle. It was a shining marble structure with a great domed ceiling, complete with a 360-degree view of the city below. However, nobody has been able to authenticate the tomb 100%. All we really know is that it belonged to someone important, and that important person really could have been Aristotle. The Althorpe Estate The Althorpe Estate was the childhood home of Princess Diana. It's one of the most important places anywhere in England. As it turns out, the estate itself happens to be on a very large piece of land, which archaeologists have been exploring. What they recently found, completely by accident, is nothing short of amazing. First of all, the Althorpe Estate has been home to the Spencer family since 1508. However, Archaeologists now know that on the grounds of this immense estate, there was once a village from the 14th century and a potential settlement used by Neanderthals 40,000 years ago. The more recent settlement was actually what archaeologists were searching for. It's called Oletorp, and historical texts say that the small village was completely annihilated by the Black Death in the 14th century. But it was while looking for evidence of this medieval town that the archaeologists discovered evidence of Neanderthal activity. They had not been expecting that. For those who don't know, Neanderthals are believed to be our closest relative. They mysteriously died out between 40,000 and 44,000 years ago. It was right around their time of extinction that they had been living on the grounds of the Althorpe estate. Archaeologists found seashells and antlers, as well as pieces of flint, in an ancient garbage dump. The discovery is proof that Neanderthals had been making tools at this location, probably from the bones, shells, and antlers of animals that they killed and ate. Lactose Intolerant Mummified Man Erika and Helmut Simon went on a hiking adventure in the Oztal Alps in Austria. It was literally just supposed to be a hiking trip. 
They had never anticipated that they would stumble upon a fantastic discovery 5,000 years in the making. They were nearing the end of their journey when they took a shortcut across the mountains and accidentally found a human body sticking out from a rocky gully at over 9,000 feet above sea level. His left arm was all twisted, he was frozen solid, and he looked to have only been dead for a few days. After making the terrible discovery, the mountain climbers got a hold of the Austrian authorities to let them know. When they went to investigate, they also thought the person frozen in ice was just a lost mountaineer. But as it turned out, this was a caveman, a literal ancient person who probably lived in caves 5,300 years ago. The authorities were suspicious when they realized he had been frozen with a flint dagger, a copper axe, and a container made from birch bark that had probably held his prehistoric lunch. He also had with him a longbow, a quiver, and a few arrows. Obviously, this guy didn't just die a few days ago. The initial examination was done by an expert named Conrad Spindler, who dated the deceased person at 4,000 years old. It was later that carbon dating revealed him to be significantly older. CT scans on his body showed three bouts of sickness in the six months before his death, and DNA investigations revealed he was lactose intolerant. Based on tissue samples, he died sometime around 3,239 BC then was frozen solid ever since. He is still the best preserved mummy that has ever been discovered, and it was a total accident. The Minotaur's Labyrinth One of the most famous Greek myths is about the Minotaur and the Labyrinth. The legend says that King Minos of Crete created the most fantastic labyrinth ever seen to house the Minotaur. The Minotaur was a punishment sent by the gods and the result of his wife's affair with a bull. It's complicated. Up until recently, nobody was really sure if there had ever been a labyrinth built on the Greek island of Crete. But now, archaeologists investigating an abandoned stone quarry believe they may have found the original site of the labyrinth. And if the labyrinth is real, then just maybe the Minotaur was too. The abandoned quarry is near the small town of Gorton, close to the southern tip of the island. The archaeologists found a complex network of underground passages that could have actually been part of a massive maze. Nobody has found it before because archaeologists were too busy on the other side of the island, investigating the ruins of the legendary palace of Knossos, where King Minos may have actually lived. Unfortunately, there is no real way to know if the labyrinth was used for storing some kind of wild animal. We can't ever know for sure if it was the great labyrinth from the Greek myth, but there was definitely some kind of tunnel system here, and it could have been a vast, inescapable labyrinth. The Pre-Colonial Mexican Book Researchers with the University of Oxford were recently experimenting with highly advanced imaging technology to uncover details about a rare Mexican codex or a large book. The Mexican codex dates from before the Americas were ever colonized by the Europeans. Amazingly, it's been hidden from the eyes of outsiders for just about 500 years. The code was concealed beneath a layer of plaster on the back of a manuscript called the Codex Selden. It was hidden, completely invisible to the human eye. It wasn't until scientists used hyperspectral imaging that they uncovered the pictographic scenes hidden beneath the plaster. Think of it like invisible ink, except with a manuscript written on a piece of deer hide. The original hide had been used as a 20-page document, but was later covered up with plaster and reused to make the Codex Selden. The Codex was from around 1560, one of only five examples that still survive from the Mixtec era of ancient Mexico, what is today Oaxaca. The Codex is a list of dynasties and genealogies throughout local history, kind of like a record of everyone's families and the ruling parties. It's the best window archaeologists have into Mexico's ancient past, but because the writing consists of pictures and symbols instead of letters, it's quite difficult to decipher. As for what scientists found beneath the more recent document, it's just more pictures and symbols that they have not been able to translate yet. They know that the original manuscript was probably quite similar to the Codex Selden, but they don't know what it all means. Gladiator Graves The old city of Ephesus, in what is today Turkey, was once a central power in the ancient world. It also happened to be the capital of the Roman province of Asia. It was famous for having epic gladiatorial games. Archaeologists have found graffiti on marble walls all throughout the ancient city depicting gladiators fighting in the arena. They held chariot races, death games, and all kinds of gladiator fun here. In 1993, archaeologists were excavating the city's necropolis when they made a rather unusual discovery. For the first time in history, 
they found a burial ground completely dedicated to gladiators. Of course, archaeologists have found plenty of gladiator graves throughout ancient Rome, just not a dedicated cemetery. The graves had tombstones that showed the deceased as being gladiators, with inscriptions that verified their identities. According to director of excavations Martin Steskal, they even analyzed their bones and found they matched other bones from ancient gladiators. The graves date back to around the second century, to a time when gladiators were getting extremely popular. And they weren't only criminals or prisoners of war, some were in it for the money. And many people became famous and rich because of their fighting abilities. And many of these people were buried here in this gladiator graveyard. The Lost Golden City Archaeologists in Egypt have discovered a lost golden city from 3,400 years ago. This was once a royal metropolis, designed and built by the ruler Amenhotep III, only to be abandoned by his son Akhenaten. Akhenaten abandoned his family name, the Egyptian religion, and the city his father built. He founded his own city, his own religion, and tried to change Egypt during his 17 years of rule. Oddly enough, his son, the boy king Tutankhamun, then abandoned everything his father had done and went back to the old ways. During all this confusion, Amenhotep III's new golden city was lost and forgotten. It was then buried under the desert sands and ignored until rediscovered by archaeologists in the 21st century. According to Dr. Zahi Hawass, people had been searching for this city for decades and had never found it. But in September of 2020, archaeologists came across it in the desert completely by accident. It was Dr. Hawass himself who was leading an Egyptian team in search of Tutankhamun's mortuary temple when he came across the foundations of Amenhotep III's city. They found formations of mud bricks, crumbling walls, and rooms filled with relics from everyday Egyptian life. All these treasures had been untouched for thousands of years. Because the discovery is so new, researchers are still poring over the evidence. Archaeologists are still looking at the hieroglyphic inscriptions found on scraps of clay and are still uncovering more and more neighborhoods. And they are still working to get a clear picture of this short-lived and long-sought capital. A Solar Bowl a team of German archaeologists recently uncovered a spectacular gold bowl decorated in sun motifs. The bowl was found in a mysterious settlement in Austria, dating back to the Bronze Age. As of right now, this is the first solar bowl ever found in the country, and archaeologists are struggling to figure out what its purpose was. The settlement where it was found is so old that writing hadn't even made it into the area yet, so there are no written records explaining the functions of the society. While this may not sound that exciting to you, the person who found it declared it was the discovery of a lifetime. Not only was the bowl found by accident, but so too was the settlement. Workers were called in to help build a train station, but had to put the project on hold when they found archaeological evidence. What is now a dry stretch of land was once a swamp, likely inhabited by a group of sun-worshipping pagans. These types of bowls have been found in other parts of Europe, such as Germany and Denmark. And in almost every case, the bowls with the sun motifs were part of religious ceremonies in which people gave praise to the almighty sun. This was over 3,000 years ago, during a time when Europe was lacking in organized religion. Foundations of Londinium Archaeologists investigating a building site in England accidentally uncovered a Roman house from the year 72. That was about 25 years after the Roman invaders founded the city of Londinium, the original city of London. Staff with the Museum of London Archaeology have discovered that the building had at least four rooms, contained a courtyard, and it was surrounded by gardens. Some of the walls were found with badly worn paintings of flowers, while some of the floor still had mosaic tiles. Nobody can say for certain what the building was, though some speculation says it may have been an upper-class hotel used by visiting Romans. It may also have been a kind of barracks for high-ranking military members. Archaeologists discovered a phallic-shaped pendant, which was often used as a symbol of the Roman army. But of course, it could have also just been a private home. The building stood for about 150 years before being covered over and replaced with something else. The really amazing thing is that its ruined foundations had been hiding underneath London city streets for the past 2,000 years, without anyone knowing. Who knows what else is down there? The Mithraic Mysteries the Mithraic Mysteries is an ancient Roman cult that continues to surprise even to this very day. During Roman times, they worshipped a pagan god from deep underground temples. 
but there is much we don't know about this ancient religion. At least 400 temples have been found throughout the old Roman Empire, once used by the cult members of the Mithraic Mysteries. Its followers worshipped the deity called Mithras, and they were also known as the Star Cult because they had strong ties to the celestial world. It was so widespread and was practiced for so long that it was considered an early rival to Christianity. But who was Mithras? While there are many frescoes and paintings that have been found underground depicting Mithras slaying a bull, it is unclear who it was. Even though it was so popular, very little is known about the Mithraic mysteries. Members of the cult have left behind no written accounts of how it worked or what exactly their beliefs were. It's considered to be one of the greatest unsolved religious mysteries in history. In fact, nobody even knows where Mithras came from. Some believe it was based on a Persian god. Some say Mithras is actually the Greek hero Perseus, and others claim Mithras is Orion. No historians can agree on the origins of the cult, but it is clear that astrology and the cosmos was very important to them. Scholars are now trying to search for clues in ancient texts to find out more about the mysterious cult. The UFO Cult There is a UFO cult called the Raelians, and they are waiting patiently for the return of the creators of humanity, a race of extraterrestrial beings that they call the Elohim. Technically, the Raelians refer to themselves as an organization rather than a religious group. According to the president of the North American Raelians, they already have 130,000 members distributed through 80 countries. They don't believe in God and instead think that human beings were created by aliens inside a laboratory in space and then deposited on the planet as a type of experiment. Their prophet is Claude Vorlon, a guy who used to be a journalist and even a race car driver, and he founded the organization after experiencing an alien encounter about 40 years ago. The organization that he started is dedicated according to him, to science and pleasure. Interesting combo, right? They consider themselves sexually liberated, and this has helped them to recruit new members all across the globe. There have been some very interesting claims coming from the Raelians. A few years ago, they said that they had managed to successfully clone human babies. They also use a strange symbol that has been the source of much controversy. Their symbol is the swastika combined with the Star of David both symbols coming from very different ideals. But what do the Raelians want? They say that their central goal is to create a legitimate embassy near Jerusalem so that they can welcome back the race of space aliens when they return to Earth, which will happen any day now. The Family Anne Hamilton Byrne was the leader of one of the sickest cults in Australian history. While she seemed relatively normal on the outside, able to play the harp and a fan of singing soprano, she was also kind of insane. People thought of her as quite lovely with her light blonde hair, but good looks doesn't deter from the fact that she was also the leader of The Family, the most notorious doomsday cult from the Australian 1960s. She claimed that she was Jesus reborn as a woman, and she also claimed that she had power in her eyes that she could use to enslave people with a single glance. What makes Anne so interesting is that she is one of the few female cult leaders in history, and her gender didn't stop her from being one of the most brutal either. She operated in total secrecy for 20 years, hidden in the countryside near Melbourne. She did not want her cult anywhere in the public eye, and she was only busted when two children she had been keeping captive escaped and informed the police, who raided the compound in 1987. After the raid, it came to light that Anne had collected 28 children that she used as her playthings, dressing them in identical clothing and bleaching their hair to platinum. And to keep the kids under control, she beat them starved them and tortured them. But what was Anne's goal? She wanted power over others beyond anything. She preached everything she could to get it, including a hodgepodge of Christianity, apocalyptic prophecy, and mysticism. She also forced her followers to dose themselves with dangerous levels of LSD. And in the end, all she really did was abuse children and revel in her power before she was caught, given a $5,000 fine, and then let go. According to The Guardian, she is still alive today and is almost 100 years old, but has been confined for nearly 15 years in a nursing home with dementia. The Eleusinian Mysteries The Eleusinian Mysteries were secretive rituals practiced by a bizarre cult that lasted nearly 2,000 years, about the same amount of time that Christianity has been around. The Eleusinian Mysteries were practiced by the Greeks, 
They were so important to the Greek people that the only actual road in Greece before the Romans arrived was from Athens to the city of Eleusis, called the Sacred Way. We know that the rituals had something to do with the Greek myth of Demeter and Persephone. The aim was to give initiates a vision of the afterlife so profound that it changed the way they saw themselves and the world. Those who were part of this cult allegedly had no more fear of death because they recognized that their souls were immortal. In the Greek myth of Demeter and Persephone, Persephone goes down into the land of the dead and returns to the land of the living each year. Whatever rituals were part of this cult, they were powerful enough to influence Greece for millennia, while staying a secret even today. These cult members practiced their rituals from between 1600 BC and 392 AD. However, they are one of the most mysterious cults that have ever existed, because those who were part of the cult were forbidden from discussing or writing down what they did during the rituals. This has proven to be quite the debacle with historians, who can't figure anything out. The Nine Unknown The Nine Unknown is a novel written by Talbot Mundy that came out in 1923. The novel was about a cult of nine unknown men that was founded by Emperor Ashoka in 270 BC to preserve a secret knowledge that, if it were to fall into the wrong hands, would destroy humanity. There were nine men charged with guarding nine books of secret knowledge. And while this was a popular book in the 20s, the premise actually comes from reality. At least, it seems like it might. In the 1960s, Louis Powells and Jacques Bergier wrote a book called The Morning of the Magicians, and they claimed that the Nine Unknown was a real cult, and that Pope Sylvester II even met them in the 19th century. But is there any fact in this? There is a little truth, yes. Ashoka the Great was an Indian emperor who ruled just about all of the Indian subcontinent from between 268 to 232 BC. He promoted the spread of Buddhism across much of Asia, and is even today considered to be the greatest emperor in Indian history. He managed to spread the kingdom all the way into modern Afghanistan and Bangladesh. Unfortunately, there is no historical evidence that he ever created a cult of nine unknown men to guard a secret knowledge. But then again, if he had created one of the most secret societies in history, there wouldn't be any evidence of it, would there? The Blackburn Cult The Blackburn Cult may just be responsible for the deaths of several different people. They may have also gotten away with these murders. One of the murders was of a young disciple who was baked alive to try and cure her of a blood disease. The group was charged with manslaughter but never prosecuted, and so they pretty much just got away with it. The cult was started in 1922 by May Otis Blackburn. This happened in Los Angeles, though Blackburn quickly formed a retreat in the Simi Valley. Blackburn claimed that she received revelations from angels and that she was in charge of the Archangel Gabriel. It was Blackburn's job to write books that would reveal the mysteries of life and death. But things got weird quickly. There were animal sacrifices, sex scandals, and a very strange attempt to resurrect a dead 16-year-old girl. Police actually discovered the body of the young girl underneath the residence of her parents, who happened to be in the cult. Around the dead body were seven rotting puppy corpses. The girl's parents eventually admitted to the police that Blackburn had convinced them to put her under the house with the dead dogs as part of a resurrection ceremony. Unfortunately for the parents, it didn't work. Other than believing in using puppy corpses in attempted resurrections or baking as a means of curing diseases, the cult mainly stole things. In 1929, the leaders of the group were indicted for grand theft, and Blackburn was imprisoned for stealing $40,000. After she went to jail, her unusual cult collapsed. The Brethren of Purity This group remains utterly mysterious. To this day, no one really knows what they did or still do. The group was made in the 8th century and it is distinctly a Muslim society. According to some, the group is a devout believer of Shiism, which is a branch of Muslim faith where the Prophet Muhammad's son-in-law, Ali, is the real successor to the throne. The group began in Barsa before it became Iraq and was apparently formed by a group of philosophers. They were so in tune with their beliefs that they wrote epistles of the Brethren of Purity. And here's where things get a little weird, for despite the society being known and confirmed in regards to the book and certain other things, no confirmed members have ever been recorded. Because of that, it's actually unknown whether this group died out in one form or another, or whether they are still around today. One thing that is known, however, is that they had a distinct schedule as to where and when they would meet. They would meet at the beginning of the month, where they apparently just gave speeches and talked to one another. 
In the middle of the month, they would come together to gaze at the stars and discuss the cosmos, and at the end of the month they would meet to recite hymns. The fact that we don't know all that much about the Brethren of Purity is likely why its name persists to this day. We don't know who they are or what they're doing. Heaven's Gate Heaven's Gate was a notorious cult and one of the most devastating. The leader was Marshall Applewhite, who persuaded a group of 20 people from Oregon in 1975 to abandon their families and move to Colorado. He promised that an alien spacecraft would take them to the Kingdom of Heaven. He explained to his followers that the human body was nothing but a container that could be abandoned for a more realistic existence. But when the spaceship didn't arrive, members began leaving, and by 1985, the cult was over. Marshall resurfaced in the 1990s and by 1996 had acquired a large home in Rancho Santa Fe and recruited a brand new following. He had his male members castrated, and he told people that the comet Haley Bop, which was on its way around the sun at the time, would herald the arrival of an alien spacecraft that would take them to a higher existence. In March of 1997, when the comet drew closest to Earth, Marshall and 38 of his followers drank cocktails of vodka and phenobarbital. They then laid down and waited to leave their bodies and be beamed up to the spacecraft. Shortly later, the police discovered the bodies of 21 women and 18 men lying in dark clothes and Nike sneakers inside Marshall's house. All of them were dead. The Lord of Our Righteousness Church Wayne Bent is the Messiah and leader of the Lord of Our Righteousness Church. He was also sentenced in 2008 to spend 10 years in prison for having criminal contact with a minor as well as contributing to the delinquency of a minor. The girl in question was 16 years old, and the cult leader claimed during his trial that it was not inappropriate at all what they did because it all had to do with spiritual healing. But according to the prosecutors, Wayne was caught doing bad things with the teenager and her sister of only 14 on more than one occasion. During the trial, both girls insisted that nothing else happened, but that didn't stop the court from sentencing this guy to 10 years in jail. Unfortunately for the public, he only did eight of those years as he was released in 2016 at 74 years old so that he could undergo surgery. Now that you know how the cult ended, let's go back to how it started. The young girls were part of Wayne's New Mexico cult, which he founded in 1987. The cult really didn't seem to do much other than worship Wayne as the Messiah, after he convinced his roughly 80 followers that he was the embodiment of God. They thought that they would be lifted up to heaven on Judgment Day. But that Judgment Day continuously came and went and nothing ever happened. And all the while, Wayne, their holy leader, was using his position to gain access to minors. The Cargo Cults Cargo cults are an extremely unusual phenomenon that actually occurred more than once in different places. In 1946, Australian government workers patrolling the central highlands of New Guinea discovered that the primitive people who were still living there as if it were the Stone Age were in the throes of religious excitement. As it turned out, these people had a peculiar prophecy. The prophecy said that when white people arrived in their world, their world would end. When the natives saw the white Australians, they thought their prophecy was fulfilled, and they went on to butcher all of their pigs. They killed the pigs because they believed that three days of darkness would engulf them, and great pigs would appear from the sky. They needed to have enough food and other necessities to wait out a great event, which would change their skin from black to white and end the world. But of course, this didn't really happen. And this kind of thing isn't as rare as you might think. The scant contact with colonial civilizations in the 20th century resulted in a plethora of cargo cults throughout Melanesia, places like New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, and Fiji. Cargo cults adopted a belief system based on technologies that were found because of World War II. Things like pieces of tech on dead soldiers and airdrops, or things traded by patrolling soldiers. When the soldiers were gone, the local people worshipped their technologies and formed cults around them, thinking that one day they would return and bring with them cargo. They often believed the cargo was created by magic from some deity. All sorts of strange myths sprouted around the first interactions with foreigners and the strange gifts they brought, such as the world-ending prophecy in New Guinea. Birdman Cult The Birdman Cult began in the year 1540 in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Far away from practically everything on Easter Island, the Rapa Nui created the famous Moai statues and had a very rich culture and mythology we are still learning about today. The people of Easter Island still remain an enigma, but perhaps one of the most captivating mysteries is that of the Birdman cult. Unlike other Polynesian cultures, the Rapa Nui believed in the Tangata Manu, or the human bird. 
The Birdman is one of the most famous motifs of Easter Island, a half-man, half-bird, connected to cult events at the sacred site of Orongo. During times of strife, tribes held a competition to choose the ruler of the entire island. The Birdman cult followed the winner, who would be declared Tangata Manu. Each year, warriors from each tribe would join the competition, which involved descending a cliff with their bare hands, swimming to an island to collect bird eggs, and bringing the unbroken egg all the way back to their tribal chief. Only warriors chosen by the seers of the divine could participate based on visions they had. Whichever tribe won would become the leader of the society for a full year until the next competition. According to ancient origins, the birdman ceremony was dedicated to Make Make, the chief god of the cult, god of fertility, and also the deity that created humanity. The Birdman cult most likely replaced an older, more complex cult that worshipped the Moai ancestors. The Moai are the enormous, iconic statues of Easter Island, but it is still a mystery why this much more complicated belief system was replaced with the simpler Birdman cult. When Europeans arrived to Easter Island, there was already much unrest between the tribes and the natural resources were severely depleted. Time was running out for the Rapa Nui, and fights and chaos lay just under the surface. It's believed that the Birdman religious cult was the last attempt of an isolated society to come together before they died out. Mummified Fetus and King Tut's Tomb The discovery of King Tut's tomb was one of the greatest finds in recent history. Not only was it full of unimaginable treasures, but over the years even more and more discoveries have finally been getting the attention they deserve. You may be surprised to learn that when King Tut's burial was discovered in 1922, two mummified baby fetuses were found inside his tomb. They each were found in tiny little coffins, but after the tomb was opened, they were put on a shelf at a museum in England and forgotten for 100 years. Everyone just assumed they were internal organs. One was from around the seventh month of a pregnancy and the other was from the fifth month. For nearly a century, scientists were unsure who the unborn babies were. Some believe that they were King Tut's stillborn children. To find out, they performed DNA tests in 2008. They were only able to get partial profiles, but it was enough to conclude that the fetuses are, in fact, Tutankhamun's daughters, who sadly didn't make it. When their father died, they were buried with him. The team also ran a genetic test on the remains of a woman believed to be King Tut's half-sister and great royal wife Anke Senamun. The results were also partial, but suggests that she was the mother of the two princesses. The Egyptian pharaohs were often married to their brothers and sisters to keep their royal bloodline pure. We don't know for sure who King Tut's parents were. It's believed he was the son of Akhenaten and one of his queens. There has been no archaeological evidence showing that King Tut left any children when he died at just 19 years old. The mummified babies were studied as part of a bigger effort to trace royal bloodlines from ancient Egypt. Crusader Camp Israeli archaeologists recently revealed the first ever discovery of a crusader camp in the Tsipori Springs area of Galilee. This is a camp where actual religious crusaders and knights would come stay. The Crusades were a series of religious wars between Muslims and Christians over a period that lasted from the 11th to the 13th century. Bloody conflicts erupted as the two sides fought ruthlessly for control of holy sites that they both considered sacred. With encouragement from the Roman Catholic Church, European powers launched numerous military campaigns throughout the Middle East. At one point, they seized control of Jerusalem. Evidence from the transition to Christian rule is scarce, making the recent discovery especially significant. Sipori Springs was home to numerous Christian and Muslim camps over a 125-year period. It is here that Christian forces stayed for two long months, leading up to the Battle of Hattin in 1187 when Muslim troops fighting under Sultan Saladin reconquered the area. Archaeologist Dr. Raphael Lewis said that the team unearthed different clusters of artifacts from the many camps that once dotted the landscape. The findings back up the historical narrative, which describes how Christian soldiers all served the same king, but were not a centralized force. Lewis further explained that the material culture of the artifacts improved as they got closer to the springs, indicating that crusaders of higher-ranking social status got the best campsites near the water. Oddly, the team found very little evidence of daily activities like cooking pots. They think that when the fighters left their camps, they took certain items with them back to their permanent settlements. The discoveries at Sipori Springs mark a good first step toward learning more about Crusader camps.
ice needle designs. Scientists have long known that thawing and freezing cycles in certain cold parts of the world create beautiful patterns on the ground. Rocks rearrange themselves into rings, lines, swirls, and other designs that look man-made, but are entirely natural. Until recently, researchers struggled to understand how and why this happens. A team of experts claims to have finally solved the mystery, which shows that when ice needles form, rocks are pushed into concentrated areas, causing the patterns to form. The study builds on a century's worth of speculation that the relationship between ice needles and rocks had something to do with the designs. Ice needles result from an imbalance between the temperature of wet soil and the temperature of the air, which draws moisture to the surface. When the water molecules hit the frigid air, they freeze into needle-like shapes. Researchers think the findings could be useful for studying a similar phenomenon on Mars. Images captured by the Curiosity rover show patterns that look like they were created by a subtler version of the process that happens here on Earth. There is not much water in the Martian atmosphere, but scientists have detected some evidence of tiny ice crystals in the soil. The first dinosaurs to live in herds. Nearly 200 million years ago, dozens of dinosaurs died together in the southern Patagonian region of modern-day Argentina. Scientists just announced their discovery of the site, which ultimately yielded over 100 fossilized dinosaur eggs and the remains of around 80 juvenile and adult Mosaurus dinosaurs. Equipped with a long neck and tail and a small head, Mosaurus grew up to 20 feet long and weighed as much as one and a half tons. Newborns walked on four legs, but became bipedal by the time they reached adulthood. Mosaurus was one of the larger species that existed during the Jurassic period, which came before the era of the really gigantic dinos known as titanosaurs. These ancient Jurassic plant eaters died altogether for reasons that are unclear. A recent study of the fossils theorizes that the reptiles may have died as the result of drought and were buried by wind-blown dust. Describing the discovery as one of a kind, paleontologist Diego Pol said that the site contains clear evidence that early long-necked dinosaurs were social animals who lived in herds. In a phenomenon known as age segregation, the fossils were grouped by age. Hatchlings and eggs were in one area, while juveniles were in another and adults were alone or in pairs. This shows that Mosaurus had a complex social structure with adults that played different roles, including looking after young and foraging for food. Until now, the oldest evidence of dinosaur herding behavior dated back to 150 million years ago, making Mosaurus by far the earliest known dinosaur to live in groups. Skeletons beneath a pub. While demolishing a former pub in the Irish city of Cork recently, workers found a partial human skeleton. The local police, coroner, and city archaeologist Ciara Brett were called to the scene, where they determined that the bones were historic in nature, not the result of a recent crime, and turned the job over to archaeologists. Over the following weeks, the team dug up the fragmented remains of five more people. In an interview with RTE Radio's Morning Ireland show, Brett said that the skeletons predate the 19th century building at the site, and that she thinks they are from the 18th century or earlier. The only way to know for sure is to radiocarbon date the bones, which is in the works but could take months to complete. An archaeologist who specializes in bones will also examine the skeletons. It's one of those situations where only time will tell if there's a fascinating story attached to the individuals who were found under the pub, or if they were ordinary people whose remains can help paint a more detailed picture of what day-to-day -day life was like during their time. Banana-colored catfish Martin Glatz is an experienced angler who's caught many catfish throughout his lifetime. But even this seasoned pro was surprised when he caught an enormous, bright yellow Wells catfish while fishing in the Netherlands. Something began tugging on the man's fishing line, and he could tell that he was in for a fight with whatever it was. Once Glatz got a glimpse of the creature's vivid coloring, he realized that the fish he was reeling in wasn't just big, it was exceptionally rare. Wells catfish are typically greenish-brown to black in color, depending on the type of water they're in. The specimen that Glatz captured likely has a genetic disorder called leucism, which causes reduced skin and hair pigment. It's been observed among plenty of different animals, but is not common. After all, Glatz has been fishing for most of his life, and this was the first time he ever saw a leucistic fish. He took a few photos with the catch and released it back into the water, 
where it will hopefully thrive despite being at a disadvantage among other creatures due to its bright hue. Have you ever seen a creature with leucism? Let me know in the comments below. A really weird prehistoric animal. Last year, news headlines around the world reported the discovery of a hummingbird-sized prehistoric creature encased in a hunk of amber. The animal died 99 million years ago in what is now Myanmar. It resembles a bizarre cross between a bird and a dinosaur. And at first, scientists thought it was a dinosaur, perhaps the smallest one in the world. But many experts were skeptical of this assumption, and a study identifying the creature as a dinosaur was retracted late last year, when researchers began to suspect that maybe they had gotten it wrong. New research has found that the animal is a prehistoric lizard, but not a dinosaur. Scientists discovered a new fossil of the same species and noticed that its beak was less bird-like than the subject of the first study. As it turns out, the original specimen's snout had been disfigured as the amber around it hardened, giving it a more bird-like appearance than it naturally had. Study co-author Juan Diego Daza said in a press release that the really weird animal, as he described it, is unlike any modern lizard. He further explained that many lizards emerged into existence during that time period, but they hadn't evolved to look like the lizards we're familiar with today. This actually helps to explain why scientists mistook the creature for a dinosaur. Early lizards had a mixture of characteristics that we tend to associate with other groups of animals, making it difficult even for the experts to identify properly. The Earth has slowed down. The average Earth day is 86,400 seconds long, but the speed at which the world spins isn't as consistent as people tend to think. Numerous factors affect the planet's rotation, including the oceans, atmosphere, and activity in the core. The International Standard for Measuring Time is known as Universal Coordinated Time, or UTC. It's based on atomic clocks, which unlike the Earth's spin, are precise and unchanging. Astronomical time, on the other hand, is based on the planet's rotation. So when the world slows down or speeds up, astronomical time can become inconsistent with universal coordinated time. Scientists resolve these discrepancies by adjusting UTC in units called leap seconds. The last time they did this was at the very end of New Year's Eve in 2016, when they added one second onto the year. This isn't really a big deal. In fact, since 1972, scientists have added a leap second to UTC once every 18 months on average, but they have never added what's known as a negative leap second, which is what it sounds like, a reduction of time. Well, as they say, there's a first time for everything, and that time may come relatively soon. In 2020, the world sped up, breaking the record for the planet's shortest day 28 times. The shortest day last year was 1.46 milliseconds less than the average of 86,400 seconds. The planet has slowed down this year, but it's still spinning faster than average, and if it continues spinning at its current speed, a negative leap second could be required in about a decade. But there is no telling what the world might do. It could slow down to the point where another regular leap second is required. I guess all we have to do is wait and see. Mummified Cake 79 years ago, someone baked a hazelnut and almond cake at their home in the German town of Lübeck. Before the person got a chance to eat their creation, the British Royal Air Force bombed the town. The baker's apartment building was hit and collapsed into its cellar. The cake somehow avoided being crushed and was preserved by the intense heat of the blast, which carbonized the dessert. It was discovered in its bizarrely intact state by workers earlier this year. You heard correctly, a mummified cake. After the air raid, people in Lübeck didn't bother to dig up their buried cellars. Instead, they built new houses over the destroyed ones. While the decades-old cake is no longer edible, it makes for a fascinating artifact. Experts have cleaned it up and are working to identify any dangerous substances on the blackened baked good that could react badly to chemicals they plan to use to preserve it. Sacrificial Site in Peru Finding one set of skeletal remains is fascinating for archaeologists, but to find the remains of 140 children between the ages of 5 and 14 was a shocking discovery made in Peru. The pre-Columbian burial site located near the city of Trujillo dates back more than 550 years. Believed to be one of the largest child sacrifices in history, the bodies were found at a site known as Las Llamas. 
All of the bodies had lesions on their sternums, which experts believe came from a ceremonial knife. Found at the site with the bodies were over 200 juvenile llamas, adding further evidence to the idea that they held ritualistic significance and that they were sacrificed on the same day as the children. Red pigment was also found on the faces of many of the children. Those who had the wounds on their bones suffered the pain of having their rib cages dislocated, leading researchers to believe it was done to extract their hearts as a symbol of sacrifice. The children were healthy, proving they were well-nourished when they died. Even more chilling was the discovery of 550-year-old small footprints that indicate the children were marched to the site. Dating back to the ancient Chimu people, these sacrifices are believed to have been performed to appease the gods after El Niño caused massive floods in the area. Sacrifices of this kind weren't uncommon. Similar to the site in Peru, the bodies of 42 sacrificed children were found at the Aztec Templo Mayor. But this discovery, although very creepy, is one of history's largest human sacrifices. Thanks for watching! Remember to subscribe if you haven't already for more incredible and scary discoveries. See you next time! Bye!